I'd like to introduce you to Kenise Wu. Kenise is the Managing Director at Signify Lab and our moderator for today's event. Kenise. Well, thank you, Stephanie. I'm very honored to be moderating this innovation panel today, but just maybe a few words of introduction. Here, Signify Labs provides advisory services for large company and startups to really enable growth through innovations. Right? The capabilities we offer include identifying opportunities for technology disruption, validating customer demand and product market fit, matching partners for collaboration, and accelerating the journey through strategic marketing, scaling operations, and fundraising. And previous to Signify Lab, I was president of Plug and Play Tech Center and also led corporate innovation practice at Rocket Space. Again, today, I'm very honored to be really moderated for this innovation panel of thought leaders who's been there and done that in breakthrough innovation. As you all know, innovation is not for the faint of heart, especially in a corporate environment. We'll hear from a panel on what it takes to be effective and hopefully with some practical advice that we can all take. So before we start with the question, actually we'll start with the questions for the panelists. And as Stephanie mentioned at the end, we'll also have some time for your questions. So please jot them down along the way. But before we go into the panel, I'd like for each of the panel to have a quick introduction. So not in any particular order, I'm just gonna uh, go, go in this round circle here. So John, you wanna start with the, uh, your introduction. Hello everyone, I'm John Lilly. I'm a full-time investor in early stage companies, uh, but before that, I was a big company uh, guy the most of my career. I started at P&G, did a quick 21 years there. I was the CEO at uh, the Pillsbury Company in Minneapolis, and then I uh, did 10 years of investment banking work before concluding that the only companies that were going to save the world were those driven by entrepreneurs and uh, uh, companies of very small scale. Great, Th thank you, John. Larry, you want to go next? John, uh, Larry, we can't hear you, muted, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Larry Schubert. I have uh, 30 plus years of been in the field of product development and innovation. Half that career was at um, IDEO and then I do consulting, innovation consulting now, particularly for large companies, help them build their innovation capabilities. And I just want to tell one quick story that um, is relevant to today. And that was one project that I've done that has haunted me my entire career. And that was with Kodak. So Kodak came to IDEO in the mid nineties, thinking about what that future of digital imaging might look like. And if you remember Kodak at that time, they had you know, one of the top brand, recognized brands in the world. Um, they were making film by a mile a minute. And also at that time, the first uh, consumer camera had come out from Casio. So Kodak's wish was, what, what can we do in the world of digital imaging? And we did a, an extensive exploration into the design, business, technology. We had a collaborative team with an IDEO team and, and Kodak. We basically delivered the world to them on a plate, all the different types of products, services, integrations between analog and digital, digital to analog, we, at the end of the program, presented it to George Fisher, the CEO. We presented it to auditoriums full of people from employees from Kodak. And in the end, everything that we came up with during that exploration exists today in some way, shape or form, but not with Kodak. Kodak does not exist. And the biggest hypocrisy of the whole thing was that Kodak actually invented the digital camera in, in the mid seventies. So it was, uh, it's been a very painful uh, remembrance for, for all these years, but a lot of learning in that, in that process. Yeah, Larry, that reminds me, did, uh, I think the Swiss also invented uh, the digital clock. <laughs> 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 That's a whole different story for another day, perhaps. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so thank you for that introduction, Larry. So Yvonne, how about you? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Candice and, and Stephanie for having me. Um, I am currently um, based in, um, um, not based, but I'm currently traveling in Germany. So sorry for the distracting background. Um, I have been um, in the corporate with Bosch for over 20 years now. Um, but the last seven years, I'm full-time dedicated to open innovation. 
um, first as a corporate innovation scout um, and the last four years as a full-time investor with Robert Bosch Venture Capital. That's the corporate venture capital arm of the Bosch Corporation. Um, and we do invest very much like financial VCs with a financial um, incentive. Um, and, but also we want to see a strategic fit. And I think we will have many, many opportunities during our discussion um, to, to figure out why we are doing it and how we are doing it and what are the odds and what works well. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. And Joe, please. Thanks, Kenise. Um, and thanks everyone for attending this webinar. I'm Joe Henyu. Um, I have a background in physics and engineering. And I've spent my career in R&D and product development. Uh, I started my career at Xerox PARC, a place that's uh, notorious for, uh, as an example of a large company inventing lots of great stuff and failing to reap the value from it. So I, I can really uh, empathize with uh, some of Larry's experience when he's describing his Kodak work. Um, now I'm the CEO of Triple Ring Technologies. Uh, we're a co-development company. We partner with companies big and small to innovate and develop new products. And um, I have a firsthand view at our collaborations with the Fortune 500 customers we have, but also with some of the tiniest startups, which are starting out with just one or two people. And I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to bridge that divide between the large and small co's. Mm -hmm. um, very relevant to the discussion here today, and I'm looking forward to a, a lively conversation. Thank you, Joe. I think we're gonna go right into the panel conversation. Again, I'm gonna, first part, I will uh, ask some questions for the panelists, but I also encourage the panelists to have a dialogue amongst ourselves and feel free to ask each other questions. I will keep it kind of light and lively as well. And then also toward the end, we'll save some time for the audience to ask questions. So, so why don't we get started with you, John? John, I mean, you, you have had an amazing career at some, very big blue chip company in Procter and Gamble and Pillsbury. And now you shift your focus toward really investing and advising some early stage companies, right? Uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of what worked and what didn't work in terms of how does, you know, big companies you know, leverage external innovation. Love to understand maybe your philosophy in terms of what do you think are some of the really critical success factors to really I call harness the synergy between I call internal innovation, maybe at bigger companies, and also external innovation with startups and the whole ecosystem. Kanis, uh, I'm so sorry to break your heart, uh, but I got to tell you, uh, the companies are are lousy uh, at this. They're universally lousy. There's I know of nobody, and have and I've looked at this a lot. I've no nobody who's very good uh, at the the external. Uh, internal mix. Uh, it's not in the DNA of big companies to do that. They don't hire the people who want to do that kind of work. Uh, they hire people who want a steady job uh, and who want to move up the hierarchy. And those are not people that are typically shuttled off into the, uh, the department of new. Uh, new doesn't ring the bell. What rings the bell is earnings greater this quarter than a year ago quarter. Uh, now, it's very difficult to, to innovate one quarter at a time. Uh, so companies continually tell themselves that they're going to go out there and we're going to find a way to, to uh, in, in bring in new technology. You saw that CVS this week announced that they're going to do that. They're starting a fund. They're, starting, they're partnering with a, uh, another uh, uh, venture capitalist try, to, to try to make a, a sustainability uh, fun, uh, sustainability accelerator go. And I, and I just, I, I'm so sorry, none of these people would ask me first before they run off to do that, because I could save them a lot of money. Uh, and, and because my, and I just remind people that, you know, Hewlett Packard was in and out uh, of the venture capital investing business uh, uh, more than a dozen times. Uh, th these, this, this idea of, of investing in small companies and bringing those companies into the big corporate culture uh, it, it is a is perennial, 
uh, every CEO, and inc that included me, by the way, uh, dreams of doing that uh, until you find out that that the CEO is not really the CEO cannot change the culture uh, it, it, in time to to make those relationships work. Uh, it's it's just extremely difficult to do. Now there is a secret to, to to there is one way to do this, and I'm happy to talk to you about that when we when the time comes. Okay. Wow. Now you got you got the suspense going here, John. So uh, I, I'm curious as you mentioned that, right? So uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Maybe the audience can help me out here. So in, in terms of company, big companies, right, that really have tried to. I would say maybe create more of a separate environment or separate entity sometimes, right? To be able to incubate very, I'll call innovative or breakthrough ideas. So it's the antibodies of their large organization doesn't come and attack it in time, so to speak. Have you seen some model like that work or some variations of that that you can, uh, that you can allude to here? I have not, Denise, and, okay. and I've seen people try it and try it and try it. Uh, and it, th this idea of, you know, sh and, and it's based on the kind of uh, people that, that love to do this kind of work. They're not corporate people. They're not people that, you know, want to work in that big hierarchy. So the big reveal here is that the, the only system I have seen work, and even this is quite difficult, is where the company makes the large company makes a non-control investment in uh, a company that eventually they could get big enough for them to acquire. Uh, when that happens, uh, th they have to content themselves with the idea that the little company is going to fail three or four times before it succeeds, and they have to be willing to live with that uh, threat. Uh, they have to also uh, think about how they're gonna manage this financially. Is it going to be off their own balance sheet? Are they going to try to uh, invest in an outside uh, venture capital fund, for example, to, to do this work? B both of those systems uh, have failures uh, and, and successes attached to them. But the point is to, that, that the, 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 those systems typically, whichever choice they make along those lines, typically only lasts for uh, the, the, the life of that CEO. Uh, and as CEOs, the tenure of CEOs is, is shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, you know, the, the, any program put in place to do this uh, is under threat because the first thing the next CEO does is to come in and review all the stuff that the old CEO did. And most of the time, these programs are swept out uh, with, with uh, the tide. W what does work, though, is making minority investments in these companies because they're really hard to get out of. And over time, uh, a company can actually uh, learn a lot from just observing the number of successes and failures that these companies uh, have. Uh, and, they'll, and whether or not they're on the board, they don't have to be on the board, they can just be an observer. Uh, that person, that, that individual is the most important person in the innovation process because they're the shuttle diplomat. They're the person that takes that knowledge from big co and takes it down to the early stage company and, and then reverses the process. So that is the process I've seen work. Uh, I'm, I'll bet you other people have examples of other things that work, but in my experience, uh, you know, 50 early stage, sorry, we've made 110 investment, invest in 110 early stage companies. I've worked on 50 businesses in 25 countries for, uh, for a big co. And I can just tell you that this is rarefied here. I mean, I can add to that, Kenise. I think that, you know, in Silicon Valley, every major company, automotive companies, electronics companies have these innovation centers. And I think that's a viable approach. You know, if those people in those innovation centers are excited about that type of a process, the biggest challenge is taking those innovations back into the larger organization. So there has to be a very clear process and philosophy about how the information flows between those two centers. And that's really where um, it gets difficult. But. Yeah, no, I fully agree, Larry. And I want I really want to add on this because John, there are some things I don't agree with you, but there are some things you are you're 100 percent spot on. Um, for example, we don't have an innovation center here, not the classical terms of in a part time of a um, type of innovation center because we realize and also learn from others that 
even though we then we, we do innovation here, we have to bring it back to the mothership, which is in, in Germany, I mean, makes it even worse. That's a really, really hard sell. So we rather bring the startups directly to Germany. I mean, some of them, they just, you know, bounce off the not invented here field, but some of them get through. And then you are at the real, you know, the real people, like the, the, the real R&D guys who, are, who have to build their roadmap um, and who probably are in need of a technology and are open for open innovation. Um, and so having, I have been in innovation and open innovation in all directions, like inside out, outside in, whatever, for, for over seven years now. And even, so I realized, and I don't know why it is, maybe because Bosch is a private company, maybe we, our CEOs last usually for 10, 20 years, sometimes even longer. Um, I think in the 135 years history of the corporation, we have like less than 10 CEOs. Um, it's a huge advantage. That, that's private a huge company, advantage. Completely different environment when it's a private. Yeah, private we, do, we, do, we do venture capital investments now for almost 15 years continuously. Um, it took us a while to be there where we are today. We started, I would say, just with venture capital investment, but this is only one part of I like to say to penetrate the not invented fields, uh, not invented here field of the corporation. Venture capital is one um, because we see so many startups and we can bring all these startups we see, not the only one we invest, the one we see um, and where we think they are viable, we can bring them to the corporation. Um, so Ivan, is, that a, is that an incubator model that you're talking about? No, it's not an incubator. So it's not an incubator model. It's like, I mean, when you are serious venture capital investors, and I, to, I put our numbers actually next to the Andreessen Horowitz numbers because they publish them, how many companies they see, how many startups they talk to, and how many they invest. And our numbers are more or less exactly the same. We talk to two to 3,000 companies a year, and we invest in eight, right? And maybe 100 to 50 somewhere in that range we introduce to various businesses um, within Bosch. And some of these things go nowhere and some of these things go somewhere. Um, and we partner with that startup. We, we acquired some, um, we built, they built a new product together. Um, and fun thing is John, and there I have to really disagree with you. Maybe because the Bosch Corporation is so large, not only the people who are like very, very risk adverse go there, there are also people who are more on the entrepreneurial side and they are getting rather frustrated with the very, very slow and very rigid um, product development processes. And we built like, I don't know, 10, more than 10 different internal incubators for internal ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's another path to penetrate the not invented field, uh, not invented here field. That's a great and idea. These, and these entrepreneurs, we call them sometimes entrepreneurs. I don't know whether it's a good term, doesn't matter. These people, they get like in separate kind of protected spaces. They get their own budget. Um, they, can work, they can act like an entrepreneur. And there are people who love that. And these people are probably staying with the corporation because they have this chance to show their entrepreneurial spirit. And there are very, very good examples where these entrepreneurs, ent entrepreneurs really brought products to market because they, they, had, they were protected. Fun fact is that these entrepreneurs in the corporation were even more open to external innovation than the rest of the org. Absolutely. Yeah. So this was like a match in heaven that you have this internal innovation teams and you can pitch startups to them because they are not, they are different thinkers. And there I agree with you, John, but we are not doomed. There's hope. Yes. I think um, Yvonne is hitting on a point that we've seen over many hundreds of projects, which is this notion of externalizing or separating innovation is really critical. Um, and that can be moving it to a small startup company, um, but it can also just be moving it to another building, moving it to mm -hmm. another geography. Um, we've certainly had a lot of experience working with large Japanese corporates that wanna 
put people in Silicon Valley, um, well away from the day-to-day -day challenges of sustaining engineering, uh, weekly and monthly meetings, uh, quarterly earnings reports. Um, I think the, the key we see is creating some uh, separation and preferably some physical separation to enable the innovation process. Joe, what's but, needed but, to sustain that though is a career path for those people. In other words, the absolutely. company has to decide that um, because Mary or Fred goes off to do one of these adventures, that we're not going to take them off the promotion <laughs> list. We're going to give put them in the bonus plan. We're going to move them up Ab in the organization. Absolutely. And I, actually we have... Um, we have a former board member who had a lot of experience uh, growing companies into large companies who always pointed out that once companies get large, a risk is that the most eccentric creative people sometimes get pushed off to these innovation centers because they're difficult to work with. And uh, it's the exact opposite of valuing them for their creativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's very important to avoid that. Um, but I, I think I want to um, build on Yvonne's point that we're not doomed when talking about innovation in large companies, because I do think large companies have a resource, um, or resources that are different than small companies. Small startups have the benefit of focus. They can be 110% focused on the project they're doing. They don't have the distractions. Um, but they lack a lot of the things that the large companies have. And I think one of the things that's most critical is market insight, market reach, the resources to tap into the experts in the field, the resources to know who those experts are. So that's the one connection that I see as critical um, that you don't want to separate away. You want to figure out a way to take these super focused people who are doing the development, but give them access to um, the markets, the commercial teams, the people in the field who are talking to the customers every day. And, you know, a startup just simply can't match the customer insight that a well-functioning commercial organization at a large company has. Yeah, I mean, I want to reiterate that um, I, I don't think all, uh, you know all hope is lost. I think there's a lot of potential for larger organizations, and I I, I, t I tend to define it, it's not so much about innovation; it's about making impact. Because I think with impact, it's it's measurable and it's tan it's more tangible. And I've created this kind of framework. I'll go into a, anytime I start a uh, project, we'll go in and do kind of an innovation audit to kind of see what the culture of the company is like and how well they are positioned to potentially to be successful. And I think there's three areas within that impact that need to be addressed. One is the people, the process, and the place, right? And in people, it's all about the culture. It's about how people communicate. It's about the incentives within the organization. Um, Process-wise, it's about human-centered design, prototyping, and being highly iterative. And when it comes to place or the environment with you work, which with you work in, it's either physical, digital, or even the kind of emotional aspect of that environment. And the kind of key philosophy that that needs to tie all three of those together, I talk about is you know high level of creativity, collaboration, and and empathy. And if all those pieces are put together, your potential for sustainable innovation or sustainable impact is much higher, but it is a very difficult road to travel and you need buy-in from the very top to the very bottom to make that happen and be prepared for a long uh, continuous- I would, I would tell you, Larry, that you can get buy-in at the very top and the very bottom. What you can't get buy-in is yeah. in the very middle. Yeah. The, the middle controls the organization. They're the, they're, they're the ones whose careers ebb and flow with whether projects get out the door. Uh, they're the ones who have the most to fear. And they're typically the people who are most resistant to change. Yeah, so, I, I totally agree with that. It just takes a very gifted CEO to push that agenda. And, you know, I've, the things I've tried, I mean, I've tried the, we're going to create a separate campus, a separate operation for innovation. I've tried the one where I threatened to fire people. 
you know, if they don't, uh, you know, meet with these early stage companies and start to bring in their ideas. Uh, we work with, I remember working with suppliers, because another thing you can do is sometimes match that early stage company with a supplier uh, in, your, in, your, in your infrastructure, in your supply chain, because that's much closer to what they're, the, they're going to wind up being the customer for that small company, and you're going to buy from that supplier. And the, the, the number of issues that crop up are significant. That's why I keep saying that the only way I've really seen this work, and, I've seen, we're, and I'll give you an example, we're investors in an optical uh, company, and um, they have uh, minority investments from not one, but two of the global optical uh, companies in the world. Uh, you'd know, you'd, companies, you'd know their name. And uh, it, they, they both have observers on the board, uh, they don't meet together without lawyers in, in the room. Uh, they are each uh, possible acquirers of this company or parts of their technology, but they really make the company better. Uh, they, they really contribute ideas to keep the company's feet on the ground. Joe, unfortunately, were it only true that, com that little companies can focus only on one thing at a time, the problem <laughs> is they all want to do this. They all want to focus on everything at once. And, and you know, keeping them focused on some, getting something into the market is a really uh, a, a t t very difficult challenge. So all, all I'm saying is uh, th that, um, and I don't, Yvonne, I'd be interested to know what you, how you guys have approached this, uh, this notion of sprinkling investment. By the way, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. A million or three million dollars goes a long way uh, to give you influence, access, and a, and a foot in the door uh, at these technology companies. Yeah, and I think a very, very important um, point is, John, you mentioned from an investment perspective, if you want to do corporate venture capital, um, we realized that's our strategy and we think it's the, the best one, of course, that we are open to co-invest with our biggest competitors. Amen. Um, we are doing only minority investments. We don't have any awkward side letters or offers. Um, we act like any institutional investor. Um, we do also leading round, we do also lead rounds and then we eventually also getting a board seat. We do this only where we think in, in, in startups and companies where we think we have competence to do that. If this is not you know a field where Bosch is like um, or the investor is very confident in, then it's probably better to be only an observer and and to follow. But we did invest with one of our largest competitors and even in the automotive space, and this created so much noise, I would say positive noise in the industry. Um, I think this was very, very helpful for the startup. And I mean, I was actually, I was really, really surprised by the amount of noise um, created mm. because we and the um, yeah, large automotive OEM, um, uh, not OEM tier one, sorry. We invested the same amount, same terms. Uh, we wanted to be like, very, very even in terms of, of power, um, because I thought this was the best for the startup. Um, and, and this created also within Bosch a lot of noise. Um, and this led me to one saying, um, I hope I invented it, but I'm not 100% sure, um, <laughs> that fear of missing out, FOMO, is one of the best cures of not invented here, of NIH. Boy, is that um, that is very smart. And, um, yeah, and I, I, now I'm preaching that. I, I was going to ask you the question, Yvonne. I mean, it's like what, one of the challenges or, or conventional thinking, right, of getting from a startup point of view, getting investment from a large corporation is the ability to, is to, is to make sure the startup is not locked in and still have a chance to grow the business and scale the business with other players in the ecosystem yeah. and competitors, right? So I think that that's yeah. a very tricky one. So you seem to have navigated that a bit, right? So what? how did you pull that off? I mean, that, that, that sounds pretty complicated to pull off, right? So it's not complicated. It's just that our mandate is not, you know, we don't invest because there is a, there is a contract upcoming or there is a positive um, conducted proof of concept. We invest in the startup because we see, we see a strategic fit. And this strategic fit can also be like in a longer run, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. a distant, not distant, not too distant future mm -hmm. where the engineering at Bosch is probably not there yet, but they mm -hmm. might be there or there's a very high chance that they are there in five years. Mm -hmm. And the highest level management, they understand that. 
right? We mm -hmm. talked about it, right? The high level management, they understand the low level people are excited and the middle management, um, fortunately they don't have a say in our investment decision so because yeah. because we invest so we are independent so the the venture group we invest like a financial vc we have a partner structure and we vote on deals period and we decide on the strategic fit very early together with an advisory board which is Bosch mm -hmm. people but again this is very high level people and they get it and that's how we do it and therefore we can invest with our largest competitors we can invest in topics where the middle management and Bosch currently don't see the impact yet. Um, and we are opening, we are opening, I, I always feel like we are opening doors, but we are also opening minds. And it also helps the engineers. I mean, they are not bad people, right? They just have different incentives and they have different targets, mm -hmm. but we help them to get used to the idea that we invest in startups we help them to get a little, little kind of insights in how these startups work, how they progress. And they probably get even used to that we invested in the startup for the last five, three, five years. And they can see the progress from a distance. And then they probably eventually change their mind and they want to work with them. So Yvonne, I'm curious how you're incentivized in corporate venture capital are you pushed to deliver a return or is that intangible education of the uh, corporation part of what you're expected to deliver? It's both. We are also, and, we are, we are also, um, we also are incentivized by return, by financial return. But, and, but of and course, how, we, we, yeah. And, and how does Bosch measure that intangible? Um, so there are, we have like a couple of different metrics. Um, one is very, very superficial, how the top level management of all the different business units, how, how satisfied they are with our service, let's say it like that, with our contribution. Um, and we have also very tangible things where we started a couple of years ago, we simply started counting the number of proof of concepts. But we all know that the number of proof of concepts alone is, doesn't do the trick. But after we increase the number of proof of concepts, we could also then measure the value of the proof of concepts. Um, what is the potential? Is this, is this a proof of concept just to do uh, market intelligence or is this one to, to really create something and to, to engage in a contract? And that's how we, how we measure also there the impact. But it took us a while to develop that. Yeah. I'm curious, John, how you would suggest incentivizing corporate venture people in your model. Mm -hmm. You know, someone making all these minority investments. What do you push them to deliver in addition to financial return? You have to separate the financing from the activity from uh, the, the business activity. Uh, this can, it, it, and what it means is the finance, the money that's invested has to come out of the pocket of the CFO. It has to be treated as uh, not in the budget of the department. Uh, whether the company succeeds or fails can't be part of that budget, can't be part of the bonus program for that company. Because immediately you put everybody uh, on, on defense and they won't want to do it because they don't want to take, they're having a hard enough time earning their bonus. Uh, it, on their current business, let alone doing it anyplace else. What you when, it, when this works, uh, what you're looking for is uh, uh, people with gray hair who, ha who have nothing left to prove in the company, who really are, have a curiosity bone uh, uh, leading them, and you put them in, in, the, in the division where that's, this is working, and you make them the liaison with this company, and you give them the job of reporting back what they've learned. The companies that are successful about this will be focused on learning, learning, learning. What can we learn from those companies and put back into our process? And I'll, I'll just bet you, Yvonne, that those engineers you described, when they see things going faster out, out in the early stage world, they say, well, wait, 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 we, can't, we can't do that. You know, well, really? <laughs> you know, it, it's, that's the kind of insight that 
that cheap and dirty research, the willingness to, make, to Larry, as you said, make a prototype, uh, make mistakes, make them early, often, and small. You know that that teaching uh, it, that that those little mechanisms in early stage companies can be adapted into the big company world, but it's not corporate lay. There's not it's not at the annual meeting. It has to percolate its way up from the bottom, individual by individual. You've got to move those people who are respected in the organization, irrespective of their level. In other words, there, you know in each of these companies, there's you know old Bob or or uh, Mary, and and they've been there a thousand years. And everybody knows them and they never got above the associate director level or something something level, but it doesn't matter because they, they they're paid, you know, like like five levels above them and they're and because they're geniuses, they're people who un, who keep the company's history in their head and in their heart. And those are the people you have to find to do this kind of shuttle diplomacy work. Right. And I think that, you know, there's big. It's, it's hard to overcome this kind of cultural fear of failure, hmm. right? And that, you know, most times you will learn more quickly and more insightfully through failure. So you have to be able to reset the whole culture around what does that mean? Failure, it's not failure, it's about learning. And the quicker you can learn, the better your results are going to be. And people need to be incentivized and rewarded for big failures as much as, as successes. It's not so much the outcome, it's, it's the process and what have you learned from it and how can you influence the organization? So it's a, it's a big cultural shift that's, that's critical. Yeah, and Larry, I actually want to kind of follow up on that because I was thinking and for the audience, too, for, the, for all the panelists too, right? Where you, you, you mentioned a little while back in terms of the, you know, the people, the process, the place, right? I was going to actually start with people right? and Javon alluded to this, which is, you know, how do you set it up or how do you set up the, I call the risk reward structure, right? Which is very different typically in a large corporation versus a startup where you literally, you literally will live and die, whether that works or not, which is very, very different than a, a large environment. And love for you, maybe comment and also just generally, how have you approached it and what have, what are the things that have worked for you in the past? Um, I mean, regarding the risk and reward structure, as I said, right, so the venture group, we are kind of, you know, outsider anyway, because we have a different incentive structure than the rest mm -hmm. of the organization, mm -hmm. um, at least partially. Um, and within the organization, we debated this a lot also with, with you know, with all the heads of the big business units, um, you know, whether we can push, I mean, we cannot officially, but whether we can, you know, encourage them to put innovation, open innovation into their, into the goals of these departments, of these not departments, business units, right? To make it also easier and, and, and more rewarding for, for that organization to, to try out things and then eventually fail. Um, that's actually pretty difficult. Um, but particularly in I mean, Germany. Particularly in Germany, what actually so far worked and, and John, I really loved your description of the gray haired middle management quirky person who loves to innovate and, and is this like this liaison partner. Right. I think and, and in that aspect, we are in a good way. So we started a couple of years ago within the venture group, we started a separate team. Um, and this team is not investors, they are only liaison partners. So they help all the startups we are scouting, including our portfolio, mm to connect them to the different business units. These four people, they are all, you know, long year Bosch people. Um, and they also have their own liaison partners in all the big business units. Um, and these, and some of these people in this business units are exactly the guys you're describing, John. And, I, and, and, it, and it helped me a lot how you described it to, 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 to figure out why they are good and why some are, maybe could be better, right? Um, and it's it's such a people business. I mean, this is what I figured out from right from the beginning. You can change an organization so much with goals and incentives, but if you don't find the right people with the right mindset and a longstanding comp company history um, who are still open and curious, if you don't place them at the right locations, then it's it's very, very difficult. 
but you have to find those people and we have so many we have so many people at some point you find them it, it um, is hard because they don't raise their hand because they don't they can't imagine that role uh, m most of them have only they've never only seen people get up the hierarchy by by climbing it's why it's yeah, why so many yeah. scientists uh, you know they, they turn into be lousy managers they're they're not wired for that work it's nothing personal uh, yeah. but but th those the people that you have doing that shuttle work have to be respected in the line organization mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. have to have credibility in the line yeah uh, it, so I, here's an example going the other way joe i was working with a utility uh, large utility, you'd be very, you know, big utility and uh, for, they're doing first class innovation work, not only for a utility, just for of, of this company. And they started their own accelerator. And it's, you know, the, they have five companies come to the com come in at one time, they have a, they have people in the company come through and teach them. And everything, you know, ha has all the trappings of, of success, except for they don't allow those people access to the line managers in the company because the CEO has said, I don't want to distract any of our existing people. So what you've done is in a, in a siloed industry, build another silo yeah. uh, and you don't allow the permeability uh, uh, between these new people. So they're, they're getting very little value out of this. Uh, and, and I said to the CEO to describe this to him and he kind of did this. I don't know whether they can fix that problem or not, but it, this idea of these shuttle people who who go through the they they if you if if people at Triple Ring want to succeed with a project, you got to find that person. Be sure they're on the team. They have to have technical credibility. They have to have interpersonal credibility, and they have to be connected to the CEO. The CEO the, the people have got to say to themselves at some level, "I better listen to Mary." Because she's got the boss's ear. Yeah, I think it's hard said to say, but that's a true fact. Yeah, yeah. And, and picking up on you know identifying those people that can be great innovators. We do a lot of innovation training workshops, and my favorite path aspect of that is at the end, one or two or maybe three people will come up and say, "Oh my gosh." this is how I think all the time, but the culture doesn't allow me to do this. They get super excited. And it, those are the people that you've got to slowly pick out and put them together and nurture to develop this more kind of innovative um, aspect and within the environment. So yeah, it's, it's what, what I call pirates. We yeah. actually have training program, how to be pirates in big companies, right? So you train the process and then you train the pirates how to break the process. But I, I maybe just kind of shift the conversation just a little bit. Thank you so much. By the way, just a reminder for the audience, if you have questions, by all means, you know, uh, keep it flowing here. So uh, let me shift the, the, the question a little bit here. And I, I, I'll ask it to Yvonne, but it's really open for the whole panel. It's about the world today, right? <laughs> you work in a very large multinational corporation. There are lots of headwinds in this world, shall we say you know, uh, lingering pandemic, economic challenges and uncertainty, rising inflation, political conflicts, right? Lots of things are changing the world, you know, in, in real time here. You know, you know, how has these changes and these uncertainties really impacted how, how Bosch and you kind of approach innovation and approach investment? Yeah, I, I thought about this question a lot and actually, Maybe because Bosch is a private company, we have a little bit more patience and we are probably looking a little, little bit more long-term, not always actually, but um, so for the corporate innovation team, for the corporate um, venture capital team, there is no change at all. It's rather the contrary. I mean, we just go ahead with the same steam, with the same pace and, 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 and increase in startups. Um, we are probably a little bit more cautious about the stage of the startup. Um, you know, if it's a money gobbling monster and still has to go for many, many years, that's probably more difficult. If it's an early stage startup with a great idea, that's probably better. Or if it's a later stage company where we see on the horizon that, you know, they become profitable or they can be, they can be, they can be, they can be quiet. 
Talk about no, the role sorry. of your own customers about how important it is for you to your how customer pull uh, can help you make choices on the right companies to identify. I mean, a customer pool, if you mean Bosch itself as a customer. No, I was thinking of your customers, the OEMs. I was thinking of, you know, the per perfect perfect situation is the move to electrification of, of yeah. automobiles. I mean, it, it can help. It can help to some extent. But um, there is also in the automotive space, the relationship between tier ones and OEMs is also a very tricky one. Mm -hmm. And depending on how strong the tier one is and Bosch whether this is good or bad, it's a different conversation. It's probably one of the stronger ones. Um, directing a Bosch and telling them you have to work with the startup works only so much. This probably works with a with a smaller tier one, with a where they have more um, more need for innovation, for external innovation. With Bosch, it's actually not necessarily the case. So that's actually not really something that works. But um, but for us and as investors, in contrary, as I said, right, we, we still invest a lot. Um, I mean, actually, the valuations are, of course, a little bit lower than the last one and a half years. But I also think that the last one and a half years was a little bit of, of an anormality. I mean, valuations in some areas got like really, really crazy. Um, and I, I just hope for all the startups that they can grow into their valuations. I think some might succeed, some maybe not. Um, so from, a, from, a, from an investment perspective, there is no need to slow down. In contrary, because we have to fuel the innovation machine of the corporation. You know, electrification is, is a thing, right? Um, Bosch doesn't want to go through a Kodak moment, right? Um, and, and, large, and, a, and a large part of the business is, is in combustion engine um, um, components, right? So we have to go in other fields. Therefore, we have to innovate. It's like almost a no-brainer. Um, it's just, yeah, we, we have to do it. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think um, along the lines of that, what's really critical is that you're always going to have these external threats whether they're environmental, economical, competitors, I mean, it's always going to be there. So there needs to be some clear corporate innovation strategy that enables you to deal with fluctuation and change. Yeah. Yeah. And that just has to be you know, part of, of, of that culture and part of the process within the organization. Yeah. yeah. And also the patience, right? And not, and not pulling the corporate um, venture capital arm like in and out and in and out, yeah. uh, which creates a lot of um, friction in, in the in this in the VC space and 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 actually harms our reputation. Yeah, I think patience and discipline is, is critical. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have actually a really good question from the audience since it's kind of the line of thinking and conversation we have here, which is that most most large organizations have an internal R and D program. You mentioned the difficulty in changing cultures in a large company. What are some steps that an internal R&D manager might take to shake things up a bit and try something new? Our key thing always is when you're trying to get things done new, small steps. Prototype, prototype often, as quickly as you can, learn as quickly as you can. And as you learn and as you're whatever you're trying new starts to take root, then you can start communicating that outside the organization and get some more, more buy-in. But it's not being afraid to take small steps and learn quickly and iterate. It's what we recommend. Yeah, and, and, and what we also did within Bosch, I mean, Bosch has a pretty large still corporate R&D um, department and they are not directly tied to the different business units. They are really corporate, like fundamental research departments um, in, in very various fields. And um, so luckily some of the Bosch top management, you know, they realized years ago that it's important to teach these engineers, for example, the Lean Startup principles, right? How to fail fast, how to iterate fast. Um, and also having a much, much better sense on how big is this business potential really? 
Um, so even though they are engineers and probably they would love to be in the lab or program 24 seven, we kind of force them to, to have this more business um, look at, at a new problem, at a new, at a new um, technology. And, and then the nice thing what happens that we realize that many engineers actually, they enjoy that. Um, and I mean, one of, my, one of my engineer colleagues, he left and he joined a venture capital group um, because he was like so enthusiastic about switching his, his mind um, in more the economical thinking. Yeah, I think that um, you know, even within the R&D, having these multidisciplinary teams are critical. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. just the R&D engineers, but you bring in special folks from marketing or sales or just a strategy, whatever that is, so that they can work collaborative, collaboratively um, and more effectively that way. And they learn from each other. Yeah. The thing the early stage companies need to know most about are the end use customers. The thing that's hardest for them to penetrate is what is the actual buyer of, of my product want? What do they want? And by the way, it's not, it's not because it's obvious what they want because the customer doesn't know what they want. Uh, you, you know, it's a matter of divining, figuring out what they really need versus what they say. Right. And sometimes uh, somebody in sales, uh, uh, you know, that ugly, awful, terrible world word that that uh, people in big companies, you know, you know, feel all anxious about this. Some somebody in sales can really help that early stage company by just directing them uh, in the right place. Talk to this person. Don't make that. No one cares about that. You've got three competitors over here making this. It's sometimes incredibly simple things, particularly in med tech. We see that in, in uh, devices. Uh, it, it, you know, there, this, it, the world is crawling with little companies making, uh, you know, zigzaggers and zots and, and having somebody that's actually in the field meeting the needs of physicians, calling on hospitals, you know, that kind of thing can be incredibly valuable. It's not, those salespeople are very hard to attract to those interdisciplinary teams because you're taking them out, out of the field where they are earning a commission. So you have the comp system, yeah. you know, is extremely important. You got to find some way to reward those people for their wisdom, not just for making calls. Right. I think, I think um, one one important thing that ties into what you just said is when you start pushing people to innovate, you need to take something else they're accountable for away. You can't just pile innovation on as yet another thing on top of the job they're already doing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. And I um, think, the, you know, John, building on that is that, yes, you have to understand the needs of your users and, and stakeholders, and you need to be able to craft a compelling user experience that will engage and provide a framework for, for development as well. Right, that's part of that. Yeah, um, there's another really good question also coming from the audience is kind of related to this question, which is how can innovators arm the large company decision makers with information, information about the real value of innovation. Anyone who want to take that one? Well, the answer is there is no real value to innovation. Uh, no, you know, innovation, that's just a, that's a word thrown around and wasted and nobody defines it. And it's, a, it's just, and, and the CEO who, you know, this is like, uh, <laughs> These these lessons are old, but the CEO who steps onto the stage and shakes his or her fist and says, "Innovate! We've got to innovate." Well, that's no damn help. That's exhorting the masses. You know that what what the only thing that counts is the fit between a customer need and your capability to meet meet it. That's all you're talking about. And to to do that, you need to do you need two things. You need to identify customer needs that you're not meeting that that you might be able to address. And you need to invent, identify technologies that can do it. Then you got to figure out how you can do that. That is the, the innovation process. But I I recommend that people not use that word. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think we we learned this in t we learned this in TQ in the total quality process in the '90s. You know, everybody was TQ TQ aholic, and we made 
uh, first class uh, bulletproof products that no one wanted. Yeah. You know, be because it was a total quality waste of time. You know, because we never really understood that that market product market fit. Right, and I agree, John. And so many companies I work with, they just don't understand what innovation really is. They think they're supposed to have it, and they talk about it, but they don't know how to do it, and they don't understand what it is. So. That's why I always shifted. That's always shifted from you know the word innovation to impact. I think you can make more definable than tangible. But. Great. Um, we're, we're almost times up here. So thank you for a very interesting conversation. But be, before we wrap, I want to maybe ask everyone on the panel a very simple question, which is: We talked a lot of really interesting topics and. Um, any kind of final advice to uh, to the audience, you know, from all your learnings and all the conversation we had today, that you can really impart on uh, on on the audience. And I will call on people. Huh? Well, how about we, we start with? Uh, which I just happen to be looking at you, Joe. We'll start with you, and then we'll go circle here on my screen here, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd say the thing that strikes me from what everyone's saying here is that innovation or impact is um, really a person level thing, not a corporate level thing. And you need to figure out a way to empower the individuals to harness their passion and capabilities to get in the trenches and do the work. It's, it's not something that's gonna be processized and IT tooled away, it, it's a, person-to-person -person effort. All right, Larry? Yeah. You know, I always fall back on the three core elements to being impactful or innovative, and that's, it's collaborative, you have to have a high degree of empathy, and there's a lot of creativity, and, and that just needs to be fostered within, within the organization and the culture in order to enable innovation. Yvonne? Yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, may maybe because I'm at least partially still the, the corporate person here. Um, I think also with open innovation, we have to be able to to um, to acknowledge the mistake, not the mistakes, but but trying out things um, like pushing startups or or startups getting pulled closer to the corporate, and then these projects are not going anywhere. We have to be open for these projects to fail as well, as much as we are as investor already, you know, well, you know, used to startups to fail. We also have to acknowledge that these projects can fail and we have to start over and try over and over again. Right. Resilience sounds like the, the, the yeah. term here. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. John? Yeah. Absolutely. And just to, to, to follow up on that, Yvonne, you know, the issue with resilience uh, and failing is, you know, you're so lucky to work in a, in a private company because you're not looking quarter to quarter as much as a, you know, a, a big publicly held is looking because you can't imagine the amount of whipsawing that goes on in companies when, when you have a big quarter. You know, it, it, all hands on deck, all innovation is stopped, all extra projects. Let's, you know, where do we start firing people? We don't fire the people who sell the company's main product. We don't fire the marketing people. We don't fire the people in the plants. No, we fire staff people. So, mm -hmm. and the staff people are, have, they're, the, they're the, the resident owners of the knowledge base of what worked in the past and therefore what might work in the future. And you know that Larry, that this is this is a story of Kodak. They, Kodak kept letting go of all the people who who knew uh, the experience of their of their digital camera going back into the seventies. The the CMOS, the, the precursor to CMOS, you know, came out of their brainchild of people who were somehow preserved in that culture, hidden off in a corner somewhere, while somebody else was making thirty five millimeter. Uh, uh, you know, movie film, and and I. So the the thing I would say to the audience: if you're in the world of trying to save the world, you have to start at the end and move back. Start at the end. What does your customer want? What does the world need? Be as precise and specific about that as you possibly can, because that's the target you want your innovators to aim for. Yeah, 
it can't, you cannot innovate everything. You can only innovate something. And that yeah. some one thing has to be identified by leaders and leaders are the people on this phone. Well, thank you, John. I, I love the start of the end of mind is kind of what came in mind. Good old uh, Steve Covey, uh, you know, word of wisdom here. So yeah. Use them every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely here. So thank you so much for the panel and uh, what an interesting and invigorating conversation. So I can't thank you. Thank you enough for this. Uh, and I just want to remind the audience also thank you for your questions and your participation. I just want to remind the audience that this is really the first of a series of webinar innovations. So, you know, there'll be more exciting things to come. I think the next uh, series will uh, aim toward the end of the year. And also a reminder that uh, this recording and also other webinars uh, is available on Triple Ring's YouTube channel. So please go and check it out and also feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Once again, thank you so much for the panel and thank you for the audience and I wish everyone having a great day. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.